introduction to skills development and the role of the SDFs. Now listed in front of us are many acronyms that are used a lot. So it's very important to understand the jargon used in terms of skills development and just your role as an SDF. There are lots and um, in communication, a lot of these acronyms and abbreviations will be used rather than the full term. So please do um, read through this list thoroughly. And as we progress with the presentation, a lot of them will become very familiar and as you progress in your role as an SDF, then the understanding thereof will be more practical. Um, so I will make references unfortunately to acronyms, however I will try and expand as I go. Um, okay, so let's start off with the Skills Development Act. The Act um, was put into place in 1998 and the purpose of the Act was to develop the skills of the South African workforce, um, to increase the levels of investment in ed education and training in the labor market, to improve the return of investment, and to encourage employers to use the workplace as an active learning environment, to provide employees with opportunities to acquire new skills. So the purpose of the Act was put into place to achieve those objectives. Um, in the sense that training and development is a very good tool in order to, to progress the company and also to equip the employee and therefore the act was put into place to be able to govern that process. The following institutions were established by the act, the National Skills Authority, the National Skills Fund, and the Skills Development Levies Act, the CETAS, uh, the labor centers as well as the skills development planning unit. Okay, so just to expand a little, um, there's a, a time frame that the CETAs work on to achieve certain objectives within those time frames. So it normally works on a four to a five year um, time frame. And as you can see, the, the objective for the National Skills Development Strategy 1 was between 2002 and 2005, and they focused then was to was to was on training of employed workers and raising productivity levels. Then from 2006, they moved to this next phase, which ran from six to 10, and that was to drive the maximum number of unemployed um, people in learnerships and autism training, which will expand more when we cover the training intervention. And then they moved on to the third phase of the strategy, which is from 2011 to 2018, which is a bit longer, but that was to focus on skills linked with priority occupations, particularly programs leading to full qualifications, leading to an occupation that has been identified as being scarce or in high demand. Okay, so currently we are in NSDS phase four which obviously runs from 2019 and is going to run through to 2022. Okay, um, the Skills Development Levies Act. Okay, so this is one of the acts that were brought up by the, the sub-act that was brought up by the Skills Development Act. Um, so the purpose of this act, the principal aim was to finance skills development programs by a way of a compulsory levy statement. This was also to encourage companies to be able to, to, to participate in this initiative and the benefits thereof will follow as we continue with the presentation. Based on the act, every company that exceeds a threshold set for an annual payroll, um, of 500,000, so if your payroll exceeds 500,000 rand, or you have more than 50 people, then you have to comply with the Skills Development Act and the Skills Development Levies Act. So what happens is you will pay 1% of your payroll, your monthly payroll, towards the Skills Development, okay? And um, on, on the screen here, you will see what is called an EMP 201 form. Now this should be familiar. Um, and every company pays on a monthly basis. The UIF, they pay as you earn the skills development levy and all of this information reflects on the EMP 201. You will see on the left hand side there, 
um, just towards the bottom, it says skills development liability. So that means that 1522.14 is the sum that this company, this specific company, pays two stars towards the skills development levy. Okay, the amounts will vary company to company, but it's 1% of your payroll um, that reflects on your AMP to one under skills development levy, which therefore is there to encourage and also um, to, to, to get companies to participate um, more towards the skills development for programs. Okay, so now just to paint a picture, as a company, you pay levies over to SARS because your annual payroll exceeds 500,000 or you have 50 or more people. Okay, now you pay this levy over to SARS. And as, as, as stipulated in the abbreviations, one of the role players in this, pro, in this process is what we call a CETA. Okay, so a CETA is a sectoral education and training authority, which is there to govern companies per sector in terms of um, execution of skills development, especially with regards to training and upskilling. Okay, so each and every company falls within a CETA. Okay, um, so you would ask yourself, which CETA do you fall under? So all engineering companies fall under the Manufacturing Engineering CETA, which is the CETA, CETA 17, and all banking institutions fall under CETA 1, which is Bank CETA, and all IT companies, Information, Communications, and Technologies, which fall under CETA 12, which is MICT CETA. So to which CETA should your company pay their levies to? Each CETA is each company is allocated a CETA upon registration with SARS. This type of information will reflect on your EMPSA. EMPSA, which can be accessed on SARS e-filing. That'll tell you the levies that you pay over to SARS as well as which CETA your company is allocated to. Okay. You're required to complete an SDL 201 form to register for SDL. When completing this form, first-time registrants for the SDL are required to, to stipulate the CETA um, they wish to belong to. Um, in, the, in, in the form of day SARS, we just allocate the company to a CETA based on the name of the company. However, we have found that a lot of companies were allocated incorrectly, but there is an opportunity to transfer from one CETA to another. Okay, the law stipulates that employers must register with the CETA whose scope includes their main business activity. The scope of each CETA includes the specific set of industry, standard industrial classification codes. So your SIC codes are your standard industrial classification codes which describe the specific business activity. So each company should have a SIC code and then because of your SIC code, you will be allocated to a certain CETA. Should a company be registered with an incorrect CETA, an inter CETA change can be completed. However, companies have only one go at this. You can only change a CETA once. So you need to be sure what your main business activity is and ensure that you're registered under the correct CETA. Okay, so you're a company and you pay these ladies on a monthly basis, but where does your money go to? Of the SCL that you pay over to SARS, 20% of the amount is transferred to the National Skills Fund. This fund is used to fund large-scale development projects that will address national skills needs, such as training to those who are unemployed, the youth, people living in rural communities, and people with disabilities. Okay, so I will just switch over to the next slide just to explain this as I speak. So as mentioned, 20% goes towards the National Skills Fund. And the National Skills Fund funds our national goals um, that obviously through companies, um, we cannot reach the maximum thereof, so we, we reach those. So um, initiatives like your National Skills Fund, your NASFIS, which funds and bursaries and students in, in, in higher education institutions. All of that funding, all of those NASFIS funds and bursaries that the government is giving are from the National Skills Fund. So your contribution as a company also contributes to the National Skills Fund, which helps achieve national goals. 
Okay, just to go back, the CETA receives the remaining 80%. Okay, so your 80% goes to the various, the various sectoral education and training authorities, and they also then um, disperse those amounts, or those that, that, that a remaining amount in certain percentages. The first one is 10.5% 10, 10 remains with them. So this is for administration purposes because they administer all of your levies, all of your training, all the submissions, all the, the verifications, and so forth. So 10.5% goes towards the CETA. So you will see it on the diagram there. 10.5 goes to CETA for ad. Okay. Therefore, Ten point five of the slave, yes, is sent to the CETA to administer them, and the employer may claim back up to seventy percent. To be exact, it's sixty nine point five percent, of which twenty percent is mandatory and twenty nine point five is your discretion. Just to go back to the diagram there. Okay. So if you are compliant as a company um, with the entire skills development process, so just by come applying with the process okay you are able to claim back 20 percent of the levy back to you as a company for the purpose of training and upskilling but it doesn't end there you are eligible for another 49.5 so it's a total of 69.5 that you get back from SARS from what you pay just to facilitate training and upskilling in your company to a point where as a company you might you will not even spend much from your own pocket towards training but the 69.5 caters therefore for that and this is where a lot of companies fall short or a lot of companies do not have knowledge of this a lot of companies refrain from training and upskilling because it affects their budget however there is knowledge that they can get back almost more than half, 69.5 of what they pay over to science back, and they can use that for training and upskilling. Okay, if we switch over to the next slide, it shows there that since 2008 and 9 to 2015 16, the SDL transferred to CETAS is increasing. So, a lot of companies are now um, participating or partaking and it's increasing therefore the statistics in terms of skills development levy or SDL and um, to the CETAs to administer um, the whole process. Okay, will the company be able to recover the course costs from SARS? If the company fulfill certain conditions, for example, a successful implementation of the workplace skills plan, which is WSP, the company will be eligible to apply for mandatory grant rebate for their skills levy. In addition, companies can apply for funds through pivotal programs. The process differs between the seats. So yes, you will be able to claim that money back, but you don't claim it back from SARS directly, you claim back from SARS through the CETA. So if you comply with what the CETA requires, then you will get those funds back. Okay, just to expand on the CETA. CETA stand for Sector Education and Training Authority, and 25 CETAs were registered in March 2000. Um, in terms of the Skills Development Act to cover all sectors in South Africa, including government, to serve the training needs of the various industries, there are now officially 21 CETAs registered. They are concerned with the quality assuring training and education in the relevant industry. For example, one of the CETAs, registered CETAs, is the EW CETA, which is the Energy Efficient Management and Water Efficient Management CETA. So all of the courses are of, um, relating to that industry accredited with EWC, so the EWC will facilitate the training and the quality assurance thereof. The job of the CETAs is to implement the national skills development strategy and to increase the skills of people in the specific sector. Okay, the members of a CETA include employers, trade unions, professional bodies, government, department, and bargaining council where relevant from each industrial sector. The work of the CETAs, as mentioned earlier, acts as a quality assurance body for education and training in the sector. 
all CETAs will thus have an ETQA department. Okay, each CETA will specifically, in accordance with the Skills Development Act, develop a sector skills plan, which is the SSP, within the framework of the National Skills Development Strategy. They will implement an SSP by approving and monitoring WSP, so it's the role of the CETA, to approve and monitor the workplace skills plan, to establish learnerships, to allocate grants to employers, education, training, service providers, and employees. As mentioned before, you do not claim your funds from SARS directly, but from SARS through the CETA. And also monitoring education and training in the sector. The CETAs promote learnership by identifying appropriate workplaces where individuals can gain workplace experience, improving and supporting learning through the development of learning methodologies and materials, assisting in the conclusion, registration, and monitoring of learnership agreements. CETAs also liaise with the National Skills Authority as well as other CETAs on issues including the National Skills Strategy, the Skills Development Policy, and their own sector skill plan. CETAs also report to the Director General of Labor on implementation of their sector skills plan, their income and expenditure. Okay, they also liaise with employment services of the DOL and education councils and other regulatory bodies in terms of education laws of South Africa in order to improve the quality of information. They facilitate the involvement of re relevant government departments in the activities of the CETAs, and they perform any other duties imposed by the Act or any other function not specifically mentioned in order to fulfill the objectives of the CETA. So they, they um, purpose ultimately is to train, to empower, to reward, and to educate which ultimately results in people development. Okay, now there are many bodies that um, play a part in terms of quality of education and training. So just to pull back a bit, the, the mandate requirements 20% that companies can use for um, internal training, um, um, you know, Company specific training. However, when it comes to 49.5%, which is discretionary funding, that is allocated more towards pivotal training. Okay, so that is your training that would accredit you or award you with certification. The aim is to empower each and every employee to have an employable skill so that should they need the employer of that specific company, they will be able um, to contribute towards the national skills development strategy or the plan or the goal by being able to exercise that very same skill that they acquired, qualification that they acquired in the work environment. Okay. And one of the bodies that um, ensure that the qualification um, has quality and meets the standards is SACWA. SACWA stands for the South African Qualifications Authority. They are responsible for running the national qualification framework, um, also known as the NQF. The NQF is managed by SACWA and it ensures quality and genuine qualification that is nationally benchmarked and internationally comparable. Each SACWA unit standard has an assigned NQF and levels. Okay, just to expand on what is a NQF. So SACWA is a qualifications authority, but in, also in order to build a qualification, um, you need to be working on a framework. Okay, so what is the National Qualifications Framework, the NQF Framework? South Africa needed to create a national education training system that provides quality learning and is responsive to every changing influence of the external environment and also promotes the development of the nation that is committed to lifelong learning. Okay, so the NKF is a set of principles and guidelines by which records of learner achievements are registered to enable national recognition. So that is also another role of the, the SACWA to ensure that the standard is so high and is, is, is high on a national scale and also on an on a international scale, but most importantly, 
to ensure that the qualification is registered and recognized, okay? So just to give you a breakdown of the NPF structure, NPF structure is broken down from level one right through to level 10. So your level one, um, can we can break down and categorize it under GET, which is your general education and training, which will run from um, your grade one right through to grade nine. Okay, that will include formal schooling, and um, that will include education, um, adult basic education training, which is AVIT, one of the acronyms that we came across in the beginning. Um, so all of that basic training is is your level one. Okay, so a person with the NQF level two will have a grade ten. A person with the NQF level three will have a grade eleven or a two. Um which also covers now your technical sides and um, your business level four, MQF level four will have your matric, okay? Um, we'll have a matric certificate and then that will be phase of three, level two to four will be phased as your FET phase. So anybody with FET from grade 10 to grade 12 will fall under level two to four, which is the FET phase of the MQF levels. Okay, and then you have level five to level ten, which is now higher education training. So first with the level uh NKF level five will have a diploma um level or a higher certificate rather, level six a diploma, level seven a bachelor's degree, level eight a pros postgraduate uh, diploma or a professional qualification, a person with the level nine will have your master's degree, right through to ten, which will have your doctorate. Okay. So that is how the MQF um, framework scales. Okay, so we aim to improve somebody from a certain level to the next level, um, and we establish where you are and where you need to go based on this structure. Okay, the structure of the MQF as um, explained, level one is basic, um, amount of compulsory education, English and maths. So fourth two to four is a representative of additional education that takes place below university or tertiary education level. Um, your NQ five to ten is then your high education. Um, education and training at these levels can be achieved through tertiary training or through workplace providers and private training providers. Okay, so. To have a certain NQF, that means you have acquired a certain number of credits. Now, next I'm going to define the NQF credits, okay? Credits are a measure of notional hours or learning time that it would take the average learner to meet the prescribed outcomes. This includes contract time, structured learning, workplace learning, assessment, and self-study. So for every 10 hours spent, on a program, you acquire one credit. Okay, so obviously if you spend more than 10 hours, if you spend 20 hours, um, then you will have two credits. Okay, if you spend 100 and, if you spend 120 hours, that means you have, um, you have 12 credits. And if you spend, as you increase the notional hours, you get more credits. Okay, what are the minimum credits for a qualification? In order for your credits to lead up to a qualification, it would mean you have 120 credits. 120 credits are a minimum of a qualification, which translates to 1,200 hours of instruction and study. Okay, it is generally completed over a year, full-time study at a registered and accredited institution. So if you have spent that amount of hours being 1,200 um, 1, rather emotional hours, you acquire 120 credits, which is the minimum of the qualification. Now there are also an other com um, components to building up your qualification apart from your NQF and your credits, which is the uh, OFO codes and occupational categories, okay? So your OFO codes are 
are skills-based codes which enable or encompass all occupations in the South African context. The classification of occupations is based on the combination of skills, levels, and skill specifications that make it easy to locate a specific occupation within the framework. Okay, so it is important to note that when it comes to OCO code, a job and an occupation are completely different. Okay, so a job is seen as a set of roles and tasks designated to be performed by an individual, whereas an occupation is a set of jobs or specializations whose main tasks are characterized by such a high degree of similarity that they can be grouped together for the purpose of classification. Okay. So an example of your OFO codes, which are inclusive of your job, but your occupation as well. So for example, um, this is how an occupation or OFO code is structured. OFO codes are structured as so. So let's look at, for example, um, this line from the bottom. Um, a 214605 is a metologist. A metologist, um, metologist has that OFO code. However, if you're a metologist engineer, it speaks to specialization. So your metallurgical engineer will have a different occupation um, framework, okay? Um, a metallurgical engineering technologist will have a different OFO code, okay? However, all four of these people are metallurgists. So if you want to specify a job, a specific job title, you would say a metallurgist, then all of them would fall under OFO code 215, 214, 605. However, because each of them are specialized in their own trade, which refers now to not just the job, but an occupation, um, hence the OFO code. So each metallurgist or metallurgical engineer will then be split, split into their own code due to specification um, of your occupation. Okay. Who is Umalusi and what do, do they do? Umalusi is one of the bodies um, that also govern this process in terms of authenticity and quality. So Umalusi sets and monitors standards of general further education and training in South Africa. Um, Umalisi is currently responsible for the certification. So if now your qualification, having included the number of credits, having included um, SACWA and Judicial Qualification Authority, now once you've done that training and it's verified and accredited with your CETA, Umalusi will certify. <clears throat> so Umalusi verifies and then is the one that issues certification. Okay, so Umalusi then verifies the offset authenticity of certificates, um, they accredit educational and assessment providers, they conduct research to ensure educational quality, and over and above, they, that is their role as a body to um, ensure that the certification is authentic and then they issue it, because then if it reaches emergency phase, it would have passed all of the prior requirements leading to a qualification or certification. Okay, now the next question is, what is the learner's records database? The learner records database is an electronic management information system that facilitates management of NQF and enables SACWA to report accurately on most of the educational and training systems of South Africa. So your National Learners Record Database um, is where you can access or ensure or verify that the number of credits that you have, the number of skills programs, the number of single unit standards that you have acquired um, can turn into a qualification and also to track um, if you have been registered accordingly and certified accordingly and are recognized um, with the national bodies, if your qualification rather is recognized with the relevant bodies. Okay. 
Now, referring to the type of training interventions now, in order for you to get that qualification, in order for you to um, get those credits, in order for you to be verified by Malusi and Sekwa, these are the type of training intervention that the discretionary grant um, speaks to. Training that doesn't only um, award you with knowledge of what you do, but it gives you knowledge, practical knowledge as well, um, that you can walk out with. Um, and the training interventions are as follows, just to name a few unit standards. A unit standard is the smallest unit that can be credited to a learner. A unit standard can stand alone, but are generally part of the qualification. A cluster of unit standards, including fundamental learning, core learning, and elective learning, form a full qualification. Okay, so for example, if you are doing a human resource qualification, or if the end goal is to achieve a human resource qualification, you can achieve that through unit standards and skills programs. So um, you can do communications as a unit standard, which can stand alone. You are able to be employable or uh, have the potential to play a different role because you've got communications background. However, if you take your communications plus your labor, plus your skills, plus your EE, plus all the other elements that form part of the HR qualification, you can get those together and form a full qualification. Not every unit standard can stand below. Okay, short courses um, will not, in most cases, contain credits towards a full qualification. Um, many short courses are useful within the appropriate career field and can add value to an individual, individual already in the said career. So short courses could be courses to improve your knowledge of a certain topic, um, of a certain trade, of a certain skill. Um, and these are short, they can be anything from a day to six months, okay? Um, yes, in the end. You have your skills programs. Your skills program is an occupationally directed program comprising an agreed cluster of related unit standards equaling less than 120 credits and will have practical workplace experience. Constructed to constitute credits towards entry of registered qualification and delivered by accredited training provider. So your skills program will also be a short program. However, as mentioned, it could be a build up of unit standards that are less than 120 credits because that's no longer a skills program, it's now a qualification. So um, your skills program will um, form part um, of your work experience. The components will be a work experience theory as well um, and will be offered by an accredited and registered provider um, and therefore will be able to assist you to acquire a certain number of um, credits that you can build towards um, your qualification. Skills programs can be considered a mini qualification in that it comprises of a number of unit standards from the same qualification, providing learners with the opportunity to work towards a full qualification. It grows further than a qualification in that the design of the program may specify the sequence in which the unit standard must be achieved and the practical um, experience that forms part of the program. A CETA registers a skills program. These type of learning programs will be recognized under the new board definition of learnerships as legislated in the new skills development. Ladies Act. Okay. Learnerships. What are learnerships? Learnerships are a training program that combines theory at college or training center with relevant practice on the job. A learnership um, is ideally employing an unemployed um, individual and taking them through, um, putting them in the workplace to acquire practical knowledge, but at the same time taking them through a theoretical phase. So it would be 40% theory, 60% at the workplace, which at the end of the learnership, which can be anything um, 
up to 12, from 12 months to two years or three years, depending on the qualification and the number of credits that need to be achieved. If a learnership is a good um, tool to be able to um, address both theory as well as practice um, for a learner. Okay. Um, one of the benefits of a learnership, there are a number of reasons why employers should get involved in the learnership incentive. They are a way to get more skilled people. Skilled people make better workers as they are more likely to do the correct thing the first time and make few mistakes, or more likely to get the best out of their machines. So they tend to be more independent workers and are more motivated because they know why. They are what why what they're doing is important overall business and might also be less likely to leave their jobs. Okay, benefits for the learner, it provides easy access to learning, increased employment opportunities, assist in career pathing and self-development. You learn while you earn an acquisition of formal qualifications. Learnership fast track the development of current employees. They serve as an entrance into the industry for unemployed learners. Okay, so learnership is a great tool and the beauty of it is that it is funded by the CETA under the 49.5% of levels. Okay, so further to, to further expand the learnerships, there are also internships and apprenticeships. So where a learnership is theory plus workplace, an internship would be taking an individual with only theory and putting them in the workplace for a certain amount of time to gain the workplace or the practical component. The same applies for an apprenticeship, but apprenticeship is more focused on your trades. Okay. Um, recognition of prior learning is another element that um, falls under your discretionary which is there are many people who are in possession of skills and knowledge but no formal certification so in summary the rpl process is a process where you are interviewed okay and your your, your length of service your experience in that field is all gathered and acquired and then what they do is they now align it to whatever um, qualification and um, your work experience leads you to. So, for example, you could have been working in the engineering industry for over 20 years. Now you know the ins and outs, how to do this, how to do that. You actually have the same knowledge as a person that is from university. You can do the same thing that they were taught to do, but you've got no formal education. So what would happen is you would go through an RPL process where you would be interviewed and all of your experience would be um, collated. And then what they will do, they will compare your knowledge and experience against what the specific engineering qualification has, identify the gaps. So say there are two elements in the qualification that you've never done. So instead of spending four years in university, um, you can only spend that six months covering those two elements that you that you don't have, and then what hap what happens is you're tried and you're tested, and if you pass then those two, then you're in a position to acquire a full engineering um, qualification, which helps a lot of people that have a lot of experience but no um, qualification attached to it. Okay. How can I check if the courses I've completed have credits or the qualification? You can verify your educational qualifications on the NLRD, as mentioned before, the National Learners Records Database, because that speaks to SAPA. Okay, if you check your own information, you receive a full record of what the NLRD holds concerning you. Remember, your qualification is issued, is issued through Malusi, the Malusi, which certified and verified um, your qualification. That means for it to get to Umalusi, you went through SEQA. For it to, to reach SEQA, you went through the NQF structure and you did accredited unit standards or accredited skills programs or accredited learnership. So you have been registered, so you should be able to track that on the NLRD. Okay. Next is the strategic role of the SDF. Okay, so in order for this whole process to be facilitated, then you need a skills development facilitator. Okay, 
Okay. A skills development facilitator is responsible for planning, implementation, and reporting of training in an organization with CETA related duties. Okay. So in order for you to be able to access or claim back those funds, you need to report to the CETA on an annual basis. Would you report to the CETA training that you've completed, training that you intend on completing? Therefore, if there's a budget drawn up, there's funds allocated, and you access them and you achieve your goals and your targets as stipulated. However, this whole process has been facilitated by your SDF as they help to plan, to implement, and to report to the CETA. Okay, appointment of an SDF in large organizations, a currently employed training or human resources manager may be appointed as an internal SDF. However, in smaller organization, there is often no dedicated um, training or HR professional fulfilling this role. So a manager, a company owner will take it on um, to appoint an external SDF. The role can also be outsourced to a professional external SDF. Okay. The function of the SDF is to assist the employer and the employees to develop a workplace skills plan which complies with the requirements of the CETA. The function is to submit the WSP to the relevant CETA. So advise the employer on the implementation of the WSP to assist the employer to drop the annual training report and ATR on the implementation of the WSP to advise the employer on the quality assurance requirements set by the CETA. They act as a contact person between the employer and the CETA serve as a resource with regards to all aspects of skills development, communicate CETA initiatives, grants, and benefits to the employer, communicate with branch offices and all employees in the main office and office branch concerning events and grants being offered by the CETA. NSTF is a facilitator to facilitate the development of an employer's skills development strategy. They are an expert to serve as an expert resource for accrediting the employer as a training provider and for the implementation of appropriate learnership and skills programs. They are an administrator to complete and submit the workly skills plan and annual training report. They are an advisor to advise the employers and employees on the NSDS and on the implementation of its workplace skills plan. They are an education and needs evaluator to assess the skills development needs of the organization. They are a mediator to serve as a contact person between the employer and the relevant CETA. Some CETAs, however, have started to enforce that SDS should have some training and show competence against these unit standards. However, they retain the right to reject the mandatory grant submissions. Okay. It is, however, advisable to gain the requisite understanding and skills in order to ensure the quality of your submission. The training committee for organizations with 50 or more employees, the organization has to have a training um, committee, which will serve as a consultative forum to establish um, what the training needs are, um, to facilitate um, training executions, and to be able to acquire from fellow employees where the gaps are and so forth. So it will be the driving tool in terms of the training and the organization. Um, all stakeholders should be included in this forum. This forum should include uh, trade unions if they are present, employees if they are present, um, covering all designation groups, um, all occupational categories and levels, senior management, um, including the managers assigned the responsibility. This forum should engage in proper consultation. Okay, the proper consultation entails opportunity to meet and report back to employees and management, reasonable opportunity for employee representative to meet with the employer, the request and receipt and consideration of relevant information and adequate time being allowed for above steps. Okay, so ongoing interaction with and accessibility to senior management with regards to workplace skills issues is critical in the success of this progress. Okay, developing and implement, implementing a WSP. 
understanding the development of the skills plan. A skills plan outlines the planned training and education intervention of an organization. It is best practice for every organization, regardless of its size, to determine the skills gaps within the organization and to decide how they will address the gaps through training. Okay, so your, your, your skills plan is not just uh, a thumb stuck, back, thumb sucked or gathered information that people feel they need um, at that given time. It needs to fit in with what the organization has planned. It needs to fit in um, based on your, in, the interaction of the training committee with um, the staff. Um, it has to fit in and align with the sector skills plan. So the plan with the specific sector that you fall under has in terms of achieving the national um, strategy. So it's a very important plan that helps to achieve many areas in terms of um, our national skills goal. CITES based the payment of mandatory grants on the submission of a mandatory grant application which contains, contains the workplace skills plan as well as the annual training report. A skills plan should be well researched and reflect the training needs of the company before being documented into the WSP. The benefits of planning. By compiling a training plan, the STF has the opportunity to get input from various role players, now the training committee, your trade unions, your managers, ETC, to ensure that the plan focuses on the needs that exist within the company. It is important to work with management to ensure buy-in and cooperation from management as well as resource allocation. Okay. Now, conducting a skills audit is one of the tools that you can use in order to um, identify the gaps and see what training actually takes priority. In order to conduct a skills audit, also referred to as a skills need analysis, a competency profile can be developed for each job within a company. The competency profile will list the knowledge, skills, values, and other behaviors employees require to be successful in the jobs. Conducting a skills need involves using the list of competencies of a job given um, and comparing these to the list of competencies of the employee filling that particular position. Okay, so the analysis of, of these variances in competency levels gives rise to a list of possible training interventions for possible training beneficiaries. This will be put into your WSP. Okay, there are various methods of conducting skills needs analysis. Um, you can use a questionnaire, you can use um, uh, many, many different forms to acquire information and analyze gaps and therefore consult with the committee and identify what needs to be put on the workplace skills plan and what needs to take priority in terms of training. Okay. Now, skills and critical skills. The Department of Labor has mandated CETA in recent years to gather data on skills and critical skills. The information gathered is used to publish the National Skills Skills List for South Africa. Okay. In this document, the Ministry of Labor gives a comprehensive account of skills that are needed for economic growth and development. This list reflects skills that are most needed in our country and on which we need to focus efforts on acquiring and developing. The Department of Home Affairs uses this list to develop the current work permit quota list, which they publish annually. Okay, so it's also important to be able to analyze and gather what skills are scarce, what skills are critical, because if it's a scarce skill, then like mentioned, the Department of Home Affairs can be able to analyze in terms of they work from a quota and how many people they can allow um, in the country to be able to fulfill those skills. And if it's critical, then we know to focus on those. Okay. Reporting on training implemented. The ATR section requires companies to report on the training that has taken place in order to simplify this reporting process. And SDF should keep record of a skills development interventions. Um, that took place 
during the course of the year reporting the topic and the employees who benefited. Reporting take place for the period of 1st of April to 31st of March and for some seats is 1st of January to the 31st of December. Both the HR and WSP will require the following information. The number of employees that were or will be trained in the organization by job category, by race. The interventions trained on or planned, including the number of employees to attend these interventions. The penalty of submitting mandatory grant applications late is losing that grant in full. So not only do you lose your 20% mandatory, that you lose an opportunity of accessing your 39.5 on discretion. Okay, so by not complying with this, uh, the CETA processes and the quality of reporting um, and the achieving of your plans, then you get to you stand a chance of forfeiting the grant in full. And whatsoever that you trained um, falls on the company because the reporting wasn't done correctly. So an exception to this is where a mandatory grant application is submitted within six months of registration in the case of an employer who is registered for the first time in terms of section 51 of the Skills Development Ladies Act. Okay, now further information, a breakdown of the various details, what documentation is needed, the process, the timelines, the timeframes can be accessed on the skills development presentation, which is a further breakdown of the actual practical process and what your STF does. However, this information is very imperative to know the background, to know what is covered, to know how we get to the certain point. Um, of qualifications and training interventions and so forth and the various acronyms. So to access more and get further depth um, in terms of the processes, the seaters, the timeframes, the information that is needed, the documentation, all of this can be accessed on the skills development presentation. Thank you.